I, I, got, a, I got a little bit of gas. <laughs> daytime if we're shooting all over a skeleton in the daytime we're gonna be off the skeleton at night time I mean, not the black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk tomorrow. Uh, no, I'm not saying it's really silly with the mic put on. We know that training is important. However, we gotta be careful not to get stuck in a rut. Shooting static on a range during great weather conditions, during full light. We've also got to train how we think we might have to fight. Many times that's at night. And if you haven't trained with your gear, then you're probably missing some critical elements mm -hmm. to your overall setup. So this is where Costa Ludus has the restricted visibility elements theory, which we took a little bit over a week ago. And that was three nights of shooting and moving in low light. So let's give a rundown of some of the things that we learned, bad or good, about our overall setup. So first off, we ran slightly different setups or maybe even <laughs> drastically different setups. Yes. You were running all white light and I was running with night vision. I gotta tell you, the thing I learned is that when you're running night vision and you've got the right passive setup, you really can own the night. You've got the ability to shoot, to move, to identify targets, to actually get my optic onto the target without ever even having to use IR illumination. Whether it was IR light or IR laser, I found out that I could be extremely accurate just running passive setup with good night vision. I, I'm really appreciative of this setup from Apollo Gear Company. Uh, I've got the DTNVS, I've got the bump helmet, and these tubes were just spectacular. It was a lot of fun. What was one of the things that comes to mind that you learned in the class? One of the first things that we went over was gonna be handheld light technique with a rifle, depending if your rifle light went down, for example. But that was one thing that I've not really gone over on other classes in the past. I've taken a handful of light classes outside of this, and they never really went over on, hey, if your weapon light has a malfunction, taking your handheld out and actually being able to mount your rifle with that and different ways to use that as well. Why don't you grab the rifle you're running and maybe show a sure. couple of those techniques. Yeah. Make sure you muzzle me. <laughs> right? So obviously if you're 
white light goes down, you can take your handheld out. And one of the ways that he was showing with your magazine here is you can come in this way, still get your, your uh, mount on the rifle, and you still actually have four points of contact as well, right? Because you have this arm here to run it. And you can be pretty pretty accurate on where that light's pointing out. So it's a lot, it's pretty intuitive to do that. In the class, I had the opportunity to run the CZ Bren 2. This is the 11 inch and it is an SBR with a CGS Helios with the direct thread. I am running a Mod Light 18650 with the OKW head and it has the Surefire DS00, I believe, which is the tape switch as well as the I have constant on here, and I have the mod button light here as well. And then I'm running a Aimpoint T2 in a Scalarworks mount. And then I have a <laughs> Slingster by Feral Concepts. Everything performed great on it, honestly. It did what it's supposed to do, which is support me. I'm always curious when I'm running a can on how much gas to my face I'm getting when I'm shooting. And I noticed zero. I don't know if there was zero, yep. but not having a lack of a charging handle back here, you have your side charger, so you only gas potential is from here forward. That is considerably farther forward. Uh, <laughs> it's also being a short stroke piston, not being DI. That's nice too for th with run cans. And then with this can in particular, it just, everything seemed to work great. One of my favorite things that CZ did in this case, so they have a side charger that you can swap to the other side. They have this bolt lock and bolt release in here. I did not use that at all though. Running AR so much, putting that mag in and then having your thumb right here for the ping pong paddle makes it so easy. Yeah. So you can choose to run the same exact manual of arms minus your charging handle back here, yeah. which I don't really care for those, honestly. I actually like this more. It's really nice. And having the ping pong paddle on that there, you can actually walk back like that too, which is real nice to have. This whole <laughs> setup was not cheap. My wife kind of choked when I told her how much. I don't know if I can recommend it. <laughs> on the other hand, if you want to be out there moving, shooting. So you're in the PWS. Yeah, the PWS Mark 116 Mod 2M Aimpoint Micro T2. Got the Rain 1.0 because I'm still waiting for the 2.0 version. Uh, we've only had the order in for 13 weeks now. And then uh, the cloud buttons. And then I've got the Hollow Sun, and I don't even remember which Hollow Sun this is. It's the non law enforcement version of the Hollow Sun. I think it's a Griffin can, if I remember uh, right. Oh, that looks very Griffin ish, doesn't Griffin it? Griffin, it says right here. And it. Wasn't my first choice, but we'll get to that. <laughs> that's that's uh, a very great it, point. <laughs> and then, of course, the Feral Concept Sling. It ran okay. I had a couple of failures. I did not fully diagnose the failures in the dark. I stripped the mags and got new mags in. And at least once I had it not feed properly with the new mag. It's bigger and longer and heavier than I was hoping to run. I don't think it would be my first choice, but it ran and it got me through the class. It gave me lots of real estate to go ahead and get my sling out there. And I could go ahead and run the switches for that cloud light, or I could actually come all the way up and get on, on that switch for the hollow sun. So that was my, that was my rifle. Uh, <laughs> I have, I don't have any big complaints. So how it kind of started, it was more, I guess, individual technique all in the line. Yep. And then he started building that up and getting you standards to know how to communicate within each, with each other. And then we have the point where we're doing shooting and moving together in groups of people. Yep. So it was just an evolution building into, into that point. Including a little bit of groundwork, which Chris yes. always seems to do. <laughs> we shot supine, shot prone, of course. We shot urban, urban prone. Yep. It ended up being a lot of shooting, moving, and communicating within each other. So it was, it was actually a lot of team-based yep. stuff, actually. So that was good. Yeah, so that was, you know, the first night he did that, and then the second night he started moving into two-person teams, and mm -hmm. and then he replayed it at the beginning of the third when we were in Illumination there. So we did that. We did the shooting and moving. I know the first night was, he was going over the techniques on using your handheld light for when your rifle went, went down. Yep. That was a big thing, and same with the pistol light. Um, yeah, he ran us through the, the typical, he said, the modified FBI technique, mm -hmm. you know, holding it out here. Uh, he did the weaver stance technique. The weaver stance technique he had is going to be, it's your palms back to each other. Yep. Because uh, when you're doing that, you're dropping this arm, which yep. is traditional in a, in a weaver stance, which... Which we don't typically run. It, it might be a tool in a toolbox, but it's in like some toolbox that's that I probably, you know, forgot yeah. about. But anyway, but when yeah. you have this switch back here, there's almost no reason to not, if you can get two hands, I can flip this around. Let me just go ahead and grab this pistol here. I can show you. So if this light were to go down for some reason, or if I needed this handheld, I can swip, f flip 
the switch back this way, I can get the majority of a grip here and I can just press in with my knuckle and I can use the light. So yeah. that's just awesome. And also I can retain this much easier too. So it's just, yeah, and just you great can, to have. And you can actually use your hand to do other things like open a door if you need to without yep. dropping it or without fumbling, right? Night three. Well, night three, <laughs> of course, was it was pretty much all team-based moving. And that actually, that really segues into one of my key learnings. But, you know, he would set up groups to move around to various targets. And then he set up multiple groups to move around to various targets. And then he changed and made the groups even larger. So some of the last of our groups were five-man team on one side, four-man team on another. And even doing things like crisscrossing were... The, whoever the lead is for each group actually has to kind of coordinate. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going this way. My team's going with me. Yeah. You know, the other team has to adjust. And you know what? It actually was a dance that worked and it was a ton of fun. I got to say, that was yes. the most fun I had was when I was out mm -hmm. there shooting as far, part of a team, either as the team lead or one of the guys that was just following along. But, you know, even the team lead stuff was a ton of fun because now you've got to communicate with the other team to say, okay, it's time to move and we're going to move. Uh, and you got to communicate with your own team because you got to make sure that everybody with you is ready to go. And All this required communication that was not only visual, verbal, and even to some degree tactile. So this was actually my other key big learning, which was in this last night, we actually had some guys that were like, once they were done shooting, they could, and we were getting ready to move and the next guy was kind of ready. They could put their hand on each other yep. and be like, okay, I'm ready to go. And then when they were running, put the hand on the back so that you know that they're there. And then when the hand comes off the back, you know, either A, they fell behind if you're kind of in the movement process, or if you've gotten to your next spot to shoot. Mm -hmm that they've actually brought their hand off so that they're getting ready to shoot. Because I will tell you, shooting through the, the DTNBS or, or moving through this, you lose your peripheral vision mm -hmm. and uh, you need that sort, of, that sort of additional assurance that you know what's going on. You know, sometimes guy says ready when he's not ready or they're fumbling <laughs> or whatever, and you've really got to get that confirmation. Yeah, and for us, for the communication, with, we had a five-man team here, and there's a five-man team, what, 20 yards, other side. And with we all ran white light, where you guys were running nods, so two sides of that, of that right? It was really dark, and one of, the, one of the set rules that Chris had that we were focusing on for the, for the tactic side of it was you're using your white light when your gun's up and out. When you're not using it, it's off. So if we're moving around, we don't have lights on, we're moving in essentially complete darkness. Yeah. We almost couldn't see the other people. We, now we were making sure we were being safe with it. As we got closer and we knew each other's paths, we would be able to identify them enough to say, hey, there was five bodies running in the night. <laughs> so it all worked out really well. And in fact, you pointed out that the, I think it was one of the last one, runs, the white light team did the best actually when it comes to, when it came to the communication and moving. Yeah. I think there's a benefit to that though, of being able to see a little bit better. So it was really easy to communicate within your team for us. Communication is key in those sort of environments too. The number two technique that stood out to me using was if you were using a rifle and then you had a pistol without a light on it yep. and your rifle went down, I can actually support the rifle in my left hand. I'll show you here. And it's even easier with a sling, but let's say I'm up in this guy. I'm shooting, shooting, shooting. My rifle goes down for whatever it's malfunction. Doesn't matter. I have to get to my pistol. I can bring my rifle over here like this, grab my pistol, present the pistol out. I can use my powerhouse of an OKW here, turn it on, and I can actually keep working with a very high output light. And this is also a very easy way to, wherever I orient, I'm pointing that light out there. I don't have to think right where I'm pointing at. Bring my pistol out and keep working with a high powered light. So that's that was uh, that was new to me, very new to me. I never thought about that ever. I also have a handheld, so but it just gives you more more tools. And this actually feels like a viable solution too. So I guess since that was my number three, what's your number three? <laughs> I would say the urban prone and how he broke down exactly how you lay down for when you want to shoot under, for example, in context of vehicle. Yep. I've gone over some shooting on that. A lot of guys that I've taken classes from don't focus on that minutia as much. Uh, I think it actually is important though, because if you have a vehicle there and parts of vehicles can be used as cover, right? Yep. And you have, and you can't really, it's a lot harder to hide underneath it, right? So that's going to be the shot you might have to take. Yeah. So breaking down how he gets into it, why he does it, it was really, really good for me too. 
So let's talk about negatives. And for me, the first negative is my experience <laughs> with the BNT. Your main rifle. Here's the BNT, which was my number one choice. So this was really set up exactly the way I wanted it. I could have used maybe three more inches of rail, but it was pretty much set up the way I wanted it. But then when I went to sight it in with subsonics the first day, four rounds, 20 yards, three of which were keyholing. So then the next day we went to go sight it in and we kind of got it roughed in, but it was not really grouping. We could not get good groups out of it. And that was, I don't know, that was probably 50 rounds of shooting that day. And then I get it to class and I sight it in. I think I've got it nailed in. And by the f end of the first night, he, w he did the drill where he walked us back and like, be accurate, go get your hits. So I'm being, I'm taking a little bit more time than some of the other guys on the line and I'm getting my hits and I go up and I look at my target and I've got like nothing in the A zone. As a matter of fact, some of my shots I think were off paper. So I'm like, okay, this thing is just not dialing in for me. And so we dumped it. Right, so this is the BNT APC 300. You know, obviously all factory except for the accessories, and then it's got a Griffin Explorer can. So now my next task is to pull the can off, put the flash hider back on, and see if I can get it to group with supers. This is all factory ammo too, right? It's not, yeah. it's not like it's crap reloads from from uh, Joe Schmo down the <laughs> road. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It's really a bummer because it's a little heavy, but it was nice and compact. I guess the other interesting thing is, is with me having so much stuff going on here on, on the rail uh, and my button there, you can see that my hand actually gets to get tapped by the charging handle as it reciprocates. Yep. You know, uh, could be improved. You know, this one uh, doesn't reciprocate, right? I guess <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> By the way, it looks really snazzy clean. Like it kept itself very clean, even mm -hmm. with the can on it. it. It ran flawless. Yes. It didn't put rounds on target. Yeah. So the one thing that stood out to me for my gear for a negative would be the actuation of the Mod Light PL350. So I was on day two and three running this guy, one of our M7 holsters, and to turn the light on, it was great. The output, great. Yeah. We didn't use a pistol. Which, a which head's on that one? This is the PLH 5K. Okay. Like a better X300U. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So activating this light, uh, using my support hand as I'm coming out on target, I can click it on. To turn it off, my best way I have found, I don't want to use my index finger. I want to use that for either pressing the trigger or indexing where it needs to hang out so it's safe. But what I would do is I would roll my, I guess it would be my first, my second knuckle, my index finger, I would roll it up and partially break my grip for just a second, which yep. was fine. What he was teaching in the class, the, the course, was going over, light off, break the gun down, come in closer to you, come in, new mag, come out, yep. back on. The issue for me, and this could be me, I don't know, but turning that light off, it was common, whoops, it was common for me to go from here, and I just rolled through it. It'd be really cool to see if you could put something in there to stop it. So you go, hey, I know I'm gonna use it counterclockwise for on and clockwise for off and put a stopper so that it doesn't go past the off point clockwise would be kind of cool. That's my one gripe. And two other things that I think I'd point out is 300-ish rounds. It did not shear its own key. Correct. And the switches are still having that sharp click. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. And of course I was running the, you know, the, the Glock with the TLR1 and it just performed for me. Hey, what holster is that? That is a prototype of our new Origin 3 holster, which will be making a return sometime soon. So was there any other highlight or any other, you know, star of the show for you? The rifle setup I thought was great. The sling, the slingster was the first one I've been able to run that I enjoyed running that allowed me to actually be fully fished into the sling, right? Yep. Whereas a lot of two-point slings, and I only really run two points at this time, but two-point slings, and I have a mounted Surprise, surprise, the way that he likes to mount them as well, I believe he was saying, which yep. is your front point is going to be very far forward on the support hand side. And then it comes over your stock onto the other side. That is really nice, especially for switching shoulders is the biggest, yep. one of the biggest parts about that. I've been running that like that for years now. From here, when I drop it, it still retains well. Coming in here, I can switch shoulders just fine, loosening it up and then fishing back into the sling to wrap up more. 
And then if I want to tighten it up, I can just pull on that tab and I can really get in here and you can see even without this hand here, I'm supporting the rifle pretty well. So that stood out to me a lot. So I'm gonna have to get me one of these for my rifle. <laughs> we also ran, both of us, I believe, ran our, at the, oh, yeah. at the time, not for sale yet, our uh, AR magazine carrier. So that worked just great. You can choose to run these either direction as well. So you can throw it in however you want. You have adjustable retention between these four screws. So you can dial it in exactly how you want as well, but yep. they just performed. And we how found they that we found that you know, like with the aluminum mags, the GI mags, you gotta adjust the retention. The P mags, they tend to be dialed in pretty well the way we have them, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know the CZ mags actually fit a little bit differently too. Yep, everything fits a little bit differently. So having that adjustable retention that really helps. It's got that nice snap in, which we look for in our holsters as well, right? Yep, and these are. Almost the end product, but there's a few things we'll be doing to them. The first day of the class, I ran, I looked like this, but with my rifle on over my slung end. And then I put, I think, one carrier back here, and then all my other mags are just stuffed in my pockets. <laughs> and I have my Glock 45 was in my M6 appendix. That all worked just great for the day one. And then day two, I ninja it up, and I uh, <laughs> tossed on this whole belt system. And then I also ran, this is a new thing for me too. I have not ran this in a class yet until then. And in fact, all I did was I put it on, sized it, and I adjusted the straps. This is the uh, T-Rex Arms AC-1, and I have HESCO L210s in there for protection. Uh, S-TAC makes this, which is their Kiwi pouch, uh, their, their, their placard, I should say. I went prone hard. There was a guy that was standing behind me that, he's like, that was like textbook prone there, because I would just drop down. But I did crack one of the, the, the chem lights, which, putting it there, I knew that that could be a possibility. Yep. I got up and I knew I did, and on the way back it was finally illuminated all the way, and I was like, oh, this is hilarious, because I just have this illumination, because you can, it was pitch black there, so you could just see that yep. floating around, I'm sure. The course of fires were a lot of mags. We ran, we just burned through full mags. I know. Uh, so I had three here, two in my belt, and I had one in the gun, so. <laughs> yep. At the end of each drill, we I usually had a mag left. <laughs> so I think that what we learned out of the class was, it's really important to actually run your gear mm -hmm. at night, if you're going to actually be fighting at night because there's a lot of stuff to shake out. You've got a lot of things going on. You've got to not only be proficient with your weapon, but you also have to know how your gear performs at night. And I think we learned that out of the class. And I look forward to doing the next class again because I think that'll give me another opportunity to shake down my gear and help me become a better shooter in the process as well. You know, you ran the last two nights full kit i ran pretty slick right i was running uh, you know just an extra mag for the pistol and an extra mag for the rifle on the belt and then i did actually have some reloads in my pockets as well but i was running pretty slick other than my helmet and i don't think you need every single piece of tactical gear to be out there running i think guys were doing it effectively with just you know, an, an AR mag and a pistol mag on their body, mm -hmm. a holster, a rifle, and at least some sort of white light. Uh, I, I think it's important. I, th I don't think anybody in the class was running without a white light on their pistol. I think you need that. I, I think you need a, a white light on your rifle as well. You don't have to be full, full kit. Just go and train. And, and because chances are, you know, something goes bump in the night. <laughs> you're grabbing kind of minimal stuff and yeah. you're heading out the door and uh, you want to train like you fight. Now you may wonder if we're sponsored by any of these companies and the answer is no, we're works and we make holsters for pistols with lights. We just want to show you some of the techniques that we might use or learn and we want to provide good data so that you can more effectively defend yourself at night. Now if you want to learn more or geek out about lights, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell down below. And that will help you be informed when we post new content. Thank you for watching. I'm Shan with Works. Get out there and train.